Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here. It is my pleasure to bring you the next installment of Voices of the Community with our eighth grade class here at St. Charisse. We have been embarking on talking to people of the community, of the St. Charisse community, about not only Dr. King, but of the civil rights movement and how it has impacted their life. So today I have two of my fine eighth grade gentlemen, Dakache Washington and Curtis Jenkins, and they are joined by one Gary Melanson for the Voices of the Community interview. I wanna thank you all for joining us gentlemen and eighth graders, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, um, Mr. Melanson. Is it fine if I call you that? Sure. Good afternoon. Okay. The first question I'll be asking you today is, um, what is your affiliation with St. Therese Catholic Academy? Well, I go back a long, long ways. I uh, attended St. Therese with my siblings. Uh, my first year at St. Therese was in 1959. <laughs> I was in first grade um, at St. Therese. And I graduated in, uh, I guess it would have been 68. Or 67, 67. I can't keep track of so long ago. For the um, civil rights movement, how did it, um, um, like what age were you during the civil rights movement? Well, uh, the civil rights movement started uh, primarily a, a while back, but it became more prevalent in the 60s. And uh, I don't know if you've uh, uh, studied, you know, the, the presidents back then and uh, President uh, John F. Kennedy was one of the first uh, presidents that started the trying to find a way to uh, bring people of color together with, uh, with the Caucasians in, in the U.S. And my parents were, we were born, or you could say Democrats. I mean, I, I didn't know anything other than Democrats. I mean, uh, uh, African-Americans is back then we were called Negroes, actually. My birth certificate, uh, I was uh, actually born in Houston, Texas. We moved here to Seattle in 1957. Uh, and uh, my birth certificate has Negro on it, not black, not African-American. And, uh, but we were referred to as Negroes and black and African-American didn't come till later in the 60s and, and 70s primarily. But uh, John F. Kennedy, I recall my parents when he was assassinated they were devastated, especially my mom. I, I, I was in fifth grade at St. Therese and the whole country, it was just a shock. And uh, my mom was crying and I didn't get it, to be honest with you, because uh, a lot of the African-Americans felt that he was gonna be one to help us finally get over the hump in America. And that was a big setback, one of the first setbacks. Uh, so, it wasn't until later in the 60s that things really started to pick up. And I can tell you more about that based on your questions. Yeah. Was it a hard move for, for, for when you moved here from Texas to Seattle? Was it hard? Well, uh, for me, probably not so much. Uh, I was still young and we drove actually all the way from Texas to Seattle. Took a couple of days. Uh, and when we first moved here, we actually were in Immaculate Parish. I had, uh, at the time, I had uh, four other siblings. So there was five kids and my parents, and we lived with my aunt and uncle up on uh, 19th, right next to Immaculate Parish. I don't know how we all fit in the house, but there was quite a few of us in there. So we lived with them for two years and we attended, well, I didn't attend Immaculate. My older brother, Mr., the other Mr. Melanson, he and my sister were at Immaculate, and I went to, well, you probably, I don't know, T.T. Minor was a, 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 a 
school just a couple of blocks away. I went to kindergarten there until we moved over to St. Therese. So the move for me was fine. I didn't know a whole lot of difference. And, uh, but when we came to uh, St. Therese primarily, it was amazingly a diverse uh, school. We had uh, primarily it was a white kids, but we had a fair number of African-Americans, Asians, and we even had a Native American, a few Native Americans and a couple Hispanics. So at that time, it was pretty rare to have such a diverse community at Saint, in, in the 60s. Uh, my last question is, um, what was it like going to school or work during this time? Well, uh, well, you're familiar with 34th and Union, right? Up, uh, up by the mm -hmm. school, there's the corner yeah. intersection of 34th and Union. And our first jobs, we had paper routes and uh, all my brothers pretty much, we uh, had a uh, Seattle Times paper route. But after we did that, uh, I'm not sure what they call that. There's a little uh, convenience store right there on uh, Union Street. That used to be an Asian, a Chinese owned grocery store called Joe's Food Liner. And that was our real first job from the house. And we lived right, you know where the uh, Madrona Park is and the tennis courts, we live right across the street. So they would hire kids from the community. And by that time, the what was known as a central area now, is what or central district, central area was African American, totally. It had converted. When we moved there, it was still a number of white. Our, our neighbor was a Jewish family, and then we, but as uh, after, as we moved through 59 in the 60s, from 34th Avenue down to 12th to you could say Jackson, a little past Jackson and then to Madison, that became the African-American community. That was when people came to Seattle and you say, where's well, a black community or African-American, whatever you wanna call it, that's where it was. And so the Chinese grocery store hired my brothers, well, actually Mr. Mal the other Mr. Melanson, you know, your old assistant principal, he went to work there and they paid us, guess how much we got paid an hour? eight dollars <laughs> a dollar an hour one dollar one dollar and you know that was good money back for us and they paid us in cash at the end of the day you know if we, if we worked three hours we got three dollars work five hours, we, and they paid us you know cash so we always had a little money in our pocket and then my brother uh, uh mr Weinmont worked there then i worked there then my younger brother we all worked there but then one day uh the the store the, the um restaurant on the corner of 34th and Union. It's a, a beer place. I, what's that one called? A Madrona something. That was a drugstore. It was called Frank's Drugstore. And that was owned by a Japanese owner. So here you had a Chinese little grocery store. You had a Japanese drugstore. So they offered us a dollar fifty an hour or a dollar twenty five. So we said we got a raise. So we went there over there to work. Okay, and we worked those jobs while we went to school, and uh, even even off to high school. So that's why we primarily in the seventies, and then um, or excuse me in the sixties. But kind of backing up, that was in the late sixties is when the movement many really forge ahead. Do you guys you? Familiar with Martin Luther King? Yeah. What happened to him? He was assassinated. Yes. He was and assassinated. That, yes, and that sparked a whole revolution in America then. There were riots in all the major cities, as you may have learned, even here in Seattle, okay? Seattle was uh, up on 23rd and Union and there was fires and everything going on. So. That really sparked a big movement. And have you guys learned about the Black Panther Party? I have. Huh? No, a little bit? Sure. Well, the Black Panther Party was out of San Francisco, their first chapter. But what a lot of people don't realize is the second chapter 
of the Black Panther Party was established right here in Seattle, Washington by our uh, neighbors of ours. We lived on 33rd, between 33rd Spring and, and um, Marion. The founders of the Black Panther Party here were our friends growing up, the Dixons family. Aaron, well, they had an older sister, Joanne, and then there was Aaron, Elmer, and Michael. Michael was my age. Aaron was the captain, Elmer was a lieutenant, and Michael was a member. Our parents, you know, were pretty conservative. And even though we may have wanted to be part of that, they didn't allow us to do that. But the office of the Black Panther Party was again located right down there on 34th and Union. And, and uh, I think it's a, uh, it's a uh, African, um, uh, uh, what a travel agency there in that, and where the, where the uh, barbershop, that's where their offices were. And then they used to march down 34th Avenue up to Marion around the block in black, leather jackets, black berets with guns in tote and they in formation, military style. Cause a lot of these guys used to be in, in the military and was with in Vietnam. And we had a big movement here. And so I actually, uh, even though I didn't become a Black Panther, I used, we used, they used to sell the Black Panther newspaper. Okay, can you see that? And they, 25 cents, I think there's a dollar sign on there right here to re help raise money. Because are you familiar with the Odessa Brown Clinic? Maybe not. They established programs here and in America that are still here today, a free breakfast program. And I actually, um, if you can see this, uh, if I get this right, you see that? I had to have a, a card to be able to serve food to kids in the breakfast in the morning, you know? And they had that, this, this is how the program started. And now it's a government program, okay? Uh, it, was, it was pretty tumultuous. You know, we weren't allowed to uh, even go, you guys know the, the, where the ship canal is? No, the ship canal, okay, you know how you, cross over the water when you, um, from downtown, the big bridge over to, uh, like you're going to uh, uh, the U District. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the ship canal. So in the 60s, African-American and Asians were not allowed to be north of that across the bridge after dark. You had a curfew. We had to be on this side. If you were on that side and got stopped, the only reason you were allowed is if you were working like at a restaurant or something and you're on your way back home. We weren't allowed to go across it. That was the North End and Blacks and Asians weren't allowed after dark, okay? Can you imagine that today? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't even know that the curfew was that, was that strong. Yes, yes. What was the reason on that? Say that again? What was the reason on that? On well, that was part of the race racism in, in different cities around the, around the country. They were, you know, wanted their separation. And uh, in the 60s, they began, another thing was busing. They were trying to integrate the schools and all the black kids were here in the central area. And they said, well, the education we were getting here wasn't as adequate as the other schools. So they started busing us. I actually uh, went, I graduated from St. Therese and I applied to go to O'Day. As you know, or will know, you have to take a test, right? And I took the test, but I didn't score high enough to get right in, even though Mr. my brother was there, I, it didn't help me, maybe a little bit. So I didn't get in O'Day my first year, freshman year. So I had to go to public school. So here I am at St. Therese, I don't know, we had like, 200 kids in the school. And then I ended up going to, it was called Nathan Eckstein. It's, it's called Eckstein now, up north on 75th, 35th and 75th. 2,000 kids, 2,000 kids. Guess how many African-American kids were at that school? Take a guess. 
Five. Well, we have Two. 50, 50, okay? And, and I was, you know, I was like, wow. And, you know, and uh, they bust us from the central area up there. We caught a bus and then they pick, take us back every day. I, it was quite a different experience. And then I, then I was able to get into O'Day my sophomore, junior and senior year. I transferred in because what happens is kids leave and then they open up a spot because I was on a waiting list. Um, but times were totally different. Yes, uh, it was uh, our parents, even the house we grew up in, initially when they bought it, uh, well, we were gonna be on the north side of Union Street and when the, when the owner found out my dad, our family was black, he pulled it off. And then, so we ended up at our house we were at, we grew up in on the, right across from the tennis courts on 33rd. So there was a lot of separation because people felt that people of color would bring down the value of their property, okay? And so they didn't want to be by them, all right? So even today, that still happened. And in, uh, one day, if I ever find in a deed of trust, when you buy a house, you get a deed. And then a lot of the recording of the deed, it says not to be, your property is not to be sold to people of color or African-Americans. It's still on deeds today. Even though you can do it, it's still in it and they can't remove it because that was, that's permanent and the records, okay? I'm sorry, you probably have some more questions. Get your questions out. Okay. I could talk all day. Uh, my first question would be, what was it like going to school? Uh, well, to further on it, because you kind of told us about a little bit, what was it like exactly going to St. Teresa? And, uh, Cause I'm asking, what was it like exactly like going to St. Teresa? Because I wanted to know, cause towards St. Teresa from then and now, rules have been different and different type of things. <laughs> different type of things in all. Okay, well, uh, it, it was cool going to St. Teresa, but, you, the big difference, we had nuns, you know, sisters, nuns. You guys don't have any, right, in teaching, right? No. We had nuns. Not only did we have nuns teaching us, they had the whole, have you seen do you have pictures around there with nuns with the habit and the whole outfit all the way to the ground? They were covered up from head to toe. They had the big rosary beads hanging down the side. That's what we had. We had one lay teacher in, for fourth grade. And uh, uh, we had a, 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 a one male teacher did, did the PE and may have taught math or something. But it was totally the opposite of what you have now. We had plenty of priests uh, were, were at the parish. So when we were there, the our, our educators were totally Catholic administrators, nuns and priests, and uh, two lay people as, uh, at best. And that was a big difference. And, um, but I, we, everybody got along. And the other big difference, every kid at school, we were families of the parish, the parish, People that went to church, the kids all went to St. Therese. We didn't, I can't think of any people during my time, any kids that came that weren't part of the church. We were all part of the church. It was family and kids all one. Everybody knew everybody. And even to this day, we, and we refer to our, our, our classmates' parents as Mr., as you do now, Mr. Mellinson or Mr. whatever, I never knew their first name, their, our, 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 our classmates' parents' first names because they were all Mr. or Mrs. And I get emotional when they do, uh, there's, I well, probably on one hand, how many are left today? And when they do pass, it's, it brings back some good memories and, and at the same time sad to see them leave because they were, all a part of our lives growing up.
Other questions? Okay, my second question was going to be, during your later life, have you ever experienced any violence or oppression directed to you personally? <laughs> well, I, as time went on, I did have some experiences uh, when I, as I went on, I went, I went on, I graduated from old day. I had dreams and aspirations as a lot of, a lot of young people of playing professional basketball. Okay. That was my first love. And, um, I thought, that's what I thought I'd, you know, someday get an opportunity to do. And, but you had to back in those days, you didn't go from high school to the NBA. You had to go to college and you had to go all four years. So I, thought I was going to get some offers out of O'Day, but I didn't. And then I did a walk on at community college at Shoreline Community College. I played a couple of years there. Didn't, and I, I said I was going to major in physical education. And because uh, I figured that would be easy. I was all into sports. OK, I didn't want to work hard. So I tell kids today, get your education. OK, get your education. That's number one. And then uh, everything else will fall into place. But I was fortunate enough that I actually did pretty good in, in, in uh, school there. Uh, surprisingly, I, I, you know, at O'Day, I, I was happy to get a C average. Well, I was averaging a little better than a, a B plus at, at Shoreline. And I got uh, into a scholarship program they put me in. And I was, uh, when basketball didn't work out, I ended up, uh, I didn't want to go to UW, but I ended up going to University of Washington. And at the time I was at Shoreline, I decided to change my major to, uh, to ethnic studies because black history became a top uh, subject matter and learning about black history. And I know you guys probably get some of that at St. Therese, but it's just amazing to, and I said, what we don't know and didn't know about African-Americans and still to this day don't know. So there's so much more to be learned. But at any rate, I thought I'd do that. And then one day, uh, I, I was working at Sears and Roebuck, it was just, just now called Sears, down on First and Lander, part-time while I went to school. And they laid me off, and then someone mentioned that to the director of Minority Affairs at Shoreline, and they said, uh, oh, I heard you lost your job. And I said, uh, yeah, it's no big deal, I, I'm okay. They said, how would you like to work for a bank? I said, a bank? You know, I'm... Bank, I don't know about banking. I mean, there's no black people that work at a bank. And that was true, black. There was no people of color, let alone blacks that worked in bank. Well, you go in a bank and you wouldn't see any black people, any minorities at all. So he said, well, there's a training program to with uh, people of color in school to get try and get more minorities into banking. So reluctantly, I said, okay, I, I, I said, I'll do this and then I'll, I'll move on. Well, I did that. I started out and then I, when I finished at Shoreline, I got my AA degree, I, I transferred to the U, but I still wanted to play basketball. So I went and talked to the coach and uh, he said, yeah, come on out. So I did. And I ran with him a couple of weeks, but it didn't look like I was going to get a permanent spot on the varsity team. So after looking around and figuring out, okay, this banking thing doesn't sound so bad. I had changed my major to business administration. So I would go to school in the morning and uh, work till uh, school till noon, have lunch. And I went back to the bank part-time in the afternoon from one to five. So that was my day for two years. And then I went to work uh, at the bank full-time when I graduated. So one experience I had was I started, I was up North at the Edmonds branch, uh, Edmonds. Now, like I said, when you went across the ship canal, bridge like you headed north that's like way out okay and when you went to Edmonds it was like way out because they know black people out there right and so here I was I was out there working and um one day I was walking across the lobby it was a big office I was walking across the lobby and there was only one person in the teller line and this little kid looks over and sees me, he's about two years old, and he says, mommy, mommy, look at the monkey. And everybody, it was so loud, everybody like, oh, oh, and they were apologizing to me. But it was the fact that people didn't see people of color and this kid thought I was a monkey because of my skin color. 
and as the parents didn't, you know, they, they didn't tell, you know, their kids, you know, they weren't exposed to it, you know? So, uh, and then there were some other things up there, but then I, I transferred to a branch on 85th and Greenwood, which is just not too far from Blanchett High School. And I was uh, helping a guy out at my desk. He was African-American and I was helping him with a loan. And we had a African-American teller in our uh, drive up window. And this lady comes in and she's questioning this other uh, employee about what are all these black people doing in here? <laughs> and it's like, uh, it's, you know, it wasn't to me directly, but it's fact that, okay, these things happen. And then I was eventually working downtown Seattle and this is in the late seventies. And I became an officer of the bank and we used to issue what they call certificates of deposits and they had to be countersigned by an officer before they gave them out, you know, uh, to the customer. Well, unbeknownst to me, I signed one and then the lady had come back the next day to someone else that, that were selling their certificates. And they told them that something was wrong with it. And the lady and the, and the employee asked what was wrong. And they said, well, that black guy over there signed it because I signed it. She didn't think that it was any good because she didn't believe <laughs> uh, but those are some of my bank, you know, what happened in the banking side. Other than that, you know, you would sense people would move away from you uh, if you're walking down the street, you know, or when you get on the elevator, the ladies may clutch their purse a little more, but I uh, never anything physical or violent um, that I had to deal with, thank goodness. Uh, my third and last question would basically be, what was the money, uh, what was the difference in between money back then? Because like you were saying for your first job, you were only getting paid $1. And mm -hmm. nowadays, like that, would, if you're only getting paid $1, like that wouldn't do anything for you. <laughs> it's all about inflation. I, I, I remember uh, speaking out thing. Well, uh, we were cleaning out our family home and my dad, he had saved everything, right? And I found a tax return. He had a tax return and it was a 1964 tax return. And there was my mom and dad and eight kids in the family. His ta total income that year was $4,600. $4,600 to feed 10 people, pay the mortgage, utility bills. Can you imagine that today? Yeah, that's it's just amazing. So I, a dollar an hour, yeah, that was cool. Um, when I went to work for Sears and Roebuck, minimum wage, minimum wage that are in our state was $2.25 an hour. $2.25 an hour. I, I was, I, when I went, well, I was trying to get a job there and then uh, they kept saying nothing, nothing, nothing. And then one day they, this is when I was going to school still and working part-time. And they said, well, we have a porter job. I said, porter job, what's that? And they said, like janitor. I said, I don't wanna do no janitor work. And uh, they, they, then they said, well, it's $4 and five cents an hour because they were union, union people made more money. And then now this was a little, a little side story. So back then, to express my heritage, I had a big mu a mustache, had a gold tee, and you know, hair on my face, right? They said, but to work here, you gotta be clean shaving. I'm like, what? That's my heritage. I'm probably, you know, black, black power, you know? I had a fro like Mr. Nelson here, you know, okay? I think it was a little bigger though. So, um, I said, okay, well, for $4.05 an hour, I'll do it. So I uh, shaved it all off and I go to work the next day. All the other men, and they were all black and I had a, one Native American kid, they all had a mustache, but they were much older. <laughs> I, I was so upset. Um, but uh, I don't know, I forgot what, forgot what your question was. I got a little side, oh, minimum weight. Okay. so. Uh, as time went on, uh, and then I went to work for the bank, you know, uh, 
they pay you a salary, a flat, it wasn't hourly. Uh, you got a salary, a flat fee uh, based and, and they would give you raises. But even then, uh, you know, it, it paid the bills. But in today's dollars, I, in 1980, I was getting $30,000 a year. Uh, in 19, uh, by, by uh, uh, 1990, I was around 75. Uh, yeah, it, it's totally night and day. Now, minimum wage in our, well, in our state now is 15. It, it's, it's long, it was long overdue, but um, it's, even with that, it's hard to uh, have a decent living on that kind of wage. So, but what's really different is I, I was telling my kids in early 90s, you got to get into technology, IT, information tech. That's where the future is. But none of them did. Had they had, that's where the money is. Okay. It's, and it's an open market. Anybody that it doesn't discriminate for, for color, anything, anybody can do that. Okay. And they're just looking for the best people. Okay. And, and uh, my one daughter, uh, I have two daughters and, and three boys. My one daughter, she had worked for Nordstrom's. She did, oh, she was doing good. She was in, 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 in the buying department. But she got laid off or furloughed when the COVID hit. Well, she didn't waste any time. She started looking around and she actually, after two or three months, went through about seven interviews, got on at Amazon, making a lot more money. And check this, they gave her signing bonus of 47 shares of Amazon stock. How much is one share of Amazon stock? It's over $3,300. You multiply that by 47, you get around $150,000. Now, where was that when I was growing up? You don't see that as the opportunities now are way ahead. And again, it's, it doesn't matter what color you are. If you got what they need, you're hired. Thank you, Gary. We really appreciate you. And I have one last question before we go. And you've sort of alluded to it a few times, but if you had a message for our eighth grade, our youth now as up and coming people who are going to change the future, whether you're black, brown, Asian, white, because as you know, St. Teresa is a very diverse community. What message do you have for our youth here at St. Teresa? Okay. Um, well, one thing I guess, I don't know, I've always said, treat others like you would like to be treated, no matter, no matter what it is. In my business, what I do now, I, I'm out of banking. I'm a financial advisor, okay? I manage people's money, okay? And our people, some of our people have money, but the majority of the money is in the white community. I started from scratch in 1990. I left banking and went to the investment side in 98. I built up enough business. And in, in, in 2009, our, the firm I was with, uh, Smith Barney made a bunch of changes which did not benefit my clients or myself. So I left and I went to where I am now, Oppenheimer and Company. My biggest fear was, would my clients come with me? Because I'm managing these people's money and the proof is in the pudding. If they came, that means they believed in me and it wasn't about the color. That means I did the right thing for them no matter what color I was. And I was astonished that the people came, they, they, you know, when I asked them to transfer their accounts to me when I moved, they did. And it's all about how you treat people. You can go far and like I said, treat people like you like to be treated. There's gonna be people, trust me, especially my banking years, I used to get frustrated because I said, I didn't understand why people didn't like, if I, I would do stuff and I said, why don't they like me? But I. I, I came to the conclusion, you can't make everybody happy. And it's not about me, it's them. 
okay? Don't get upset. Just accept the fact it's them and it's nothing against you personally. Just do the right thing and do your best. And when you do that, you'll have opportunities like this. I'm gonna show you a picture of somebody and see if you, can you tell me who he is? I had the opportunity to meet him. This is uh, twice actually. This is when he, he wrote his, uh, if you haven't read his book, Audacity of Hope, that's uh, President Barack Obama. When he was touring the nation, I got to meet him. And then when he was running to be president, I had the opportunity to be on, in, in the Seattle area on his uh, campaign to raise money. And I also got a photograph, it's in my office with him and he was running for president. So uh, I was blessed to have that opportunity. So do the right thing and you'll have those opportunities. Mm, thank you. That is a, an awesome picture, by the way. Well, Mr. Melanson, oh, I guess our last question for those, you alluded to it once or twice, but for those who know who you are, but may not, but know who Wayne Melanson is, where is he in relation in your family? Well, like I mentioned, there was eight of us uh, <laughs> kids. Yes, there was one sister. My sister, Wanda, was the oldest. She was number one. Mr. Melanson, Wayne Melanson was number two. And I was number three. Mm. And the rest, seven boys and one girl. So, beautiful. Yes, believe it or not. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Well, again, thank you, Mr. Melanson, for Gary Melanson, for giving us your time. Thank you, Curtis. Our, our last compadre, Dikashe, had another meeting, so he had okay. to dip out early. But we have been too long. Yeah. We thank you. And uh, we look forward to uh, sharing this Voices of the Community with the St. Therese family. Great. Thank you for having me. And you guys have a great afternoon.